Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Cherry with the Division of Workforce Development. Uh, today is uh, Wednesday, March 1st, uh, 2023. Um, and today we have Dr. Uh, Ginger Chu, a Senior Scientific Advisor for CDC, who will be giving a, a talk on uh, from evidence to intervention, asthma triggers, uh, home assessment training, uh, as she discusses uh, different aspects of asthma, uh, including asthma triggers and allergens and irritants. Um, Dr. Chu, glad to have you with us, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, you can have the floor now. All right. Thank you very much. Glad to be here today. So my work on home assessment for asthma triggers started in graduate school. My first paper for my doctoral dissertation was about the limitations of home characteristic questionnaires in predicting indoor allergen levels, such as those from cats, cockroaches, and dust mites. At that time, I had vacuumed dust samples from homes uh, in Boston and showed that indoor allergens were measured in homes even when residents had reported no cats or cockroaches. I thought that dust sampling and air sampling were superior ways to assess indoor allergens. However, as I progressed in my career and realized the time and cost of collecting environmental samples, much less the time and cost to analyze them in the laboratory, I changed my perception of questionnaires. Many times those questionnaires and home inspections can be less expensive and sometimes they can provide more information. At CDC, I heard colleagues in health departments ask for good home characteristics questionnaires for two main purposes. One, to help guide home visitors on how to help residents with asthma. And two, to collect information on asthma triggers to help focus their program's efforts. At the time, there were many home assessment checklists. However, many of them had been developed based upon specific research purposes, or they were too general and only discussed a few asthma triggers. The part about it being standardized is when I reached out to colleagues at EPA and HUD. We embarked on this effort in 2015 with bi-weekly phone calls to try to use the best scientific evidence to support questions and answers that were associated with asthma triggers. When we had questions used in asthma research studies, we checked to see if there was an equivalent question in the American Housing Survey. This was because the survey conducts extensive user testing to assess if the questions and the answers are understandable and if there is any ambiguity. When questions were not available in the American Housing Survey, we would use the questions directly or slightly modified from the scientific studies and recent publications from the Joint Task Force on Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Our checklist is flexible. It, it contains a core assessment that should be asked of all residents and separate modules for dust mites and moisture that can be asked if those triggers are suspected by the home visitor or by the resident. Next to each question, we include a section about action steps to decrease exposure. After we finished the checklist, the three agencies, CDC, EPA, and HUD embarked upon a standardized training This training covers some of the most common asthma triggers found inside homes. This training supplements information in the Home Characteristics and Asthma Triggers Assessment Checklist for Home Visitors. The Centers for Disease Control Prevention, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development develop the checklist. This training follows the general order of the Home Characteristics and Asthma Triggers Assessment Checklist for Home Visitors. Most home assessment training does not cover allergy testing. However, we thought it was important to the home visitors and the residents of the home to understand the connection between the allergy testing and allergens in their home. Here is how we described differences between allergens and irritants to the residents and also for the home visitors. This graphic compares sizes of common particles found indoors. The particles are measured in microns. The width of a human hair is about 50 to 70 microns. Beach sand can be about 90 microns. Particulate matter, or PM makes up of what we commonly think of as air pollution. It is a mixture of solid and liquid particles. PM 2.5 and PM 10 are commonly measured particle sizes in indoor and outdoor air. 
PM 2.5 means that the particle size is 2.5 microns or less. PM 10 particles are 10 microns or less. Common asthma triggers are the particles from secondhand smoke, and those are parts smaller than PM 2.5. The size of the particle affects how long it stays in the air. In an empty room, larger particles can quickly settle out of the air. Very small particles can stay in the air for hours. Activity in a room or air movement can affect these settling times. Several studies measured particle sizes of asthma triggers. Secondhand smoke, as I mentioned earlier, has the smallest particles compared with those of other asthma triggers on this slide. Cat and dog allergens have small, medium, and large particles. Small particles are less than 2.5, medium about 2.5 to 10, and large will consider larger than 10 microns. The small particles of cat and dog allergens stay in the air for a long time and can be easily suspended throughout a home. Because of that, people who are allergic to cats or dogs often begin to have symptoms within minutes of walking into a home. Dust mite and cockroach allergens are mainly on large particles. They, those settle out of the air quickly. Therefore, people who are allergic to dust mites and cockroaches might not experience symptoms when they first enter a home. Mold and pollen are medium to large, but smaller fragments can stay airborne and they can still be asthma triggers. Many of the large particles associated with dust mites cockroaches, mold, and pollen settle out of the air quickly. However, they can also be resuspended in the air by various activities. That can happen when vacuuming, sweeping, cleaning, playing on carpeted floors, using fans, and tossing and turning in bed. Portable air cleaners will not clean the air of large particles that are briefly resuspended, but they can remove small and medium particles that tend to stay in the air. For example, a person with dust mite allergy would not be helped by um, trying to remove the dust mite allergens with an air cleaner. That person might benefit more by using dust mite mattress covers to keep the large particles from being inhaled while sleeping. On the other hand, an air cleaner could help with removing small particles, such as those containing allergens from mice. Vacuum cleaners with high efficiency, HEPA, filters can remove a wide range of particle sizes and should be considered for persons with asthma or allergies. Cleaning out filters and vacuum bags can lead to exposure, so appropriate precautions should be taken. Particle size can also affect where the particles go in the airways, and thus how long a person is exposed to the particle. Inhaled particles are mainly caught in the nasal passages and are sneezed or coughed out. Medium par particles go deeper in the airways but can still be coughed out. Smaller particles such as secondhand smoke go deep into the lungs and can stay there for a while, meaning that they have a longer resonance time in the body. Because gas exchange occurs in the small airways, some of the chemicals such as those from secondhand smoke enter the bloodstream, resulting in longer exposure compared with large particles. Where people live influences which allergens they might encounter. The type of home they live in is associated with different risk factors for asthma triggers. And the residents ability to control them, it, it affects the different risk factors for the asthma triggers and the residents ability to control them in their own homes. Single family homes are one unit buildings detached from any other building. People who live in single family homes might have more control over some asthma triggers than do people in multifamily buildings. However, single family homes can have different points of entry for pests and places for those pests to hide. Also, the house might have an attached garage from which car exhaust could enter the home. The house might also have a crawl space. Poorly designed or maintained crawl spaces can be damp and hide mold damage that affects the occupied space. An example are um, apartments, row homes, duplexes, condominiums, and other types of multifamily homes. They can be prone to infiltration of asthma triggers from the neighbors directly or from common spaces such as hallways and laundry rooms. Also another information, piece of information that we collect should be the number of stories. The number of stories in a building can also affect asthma triggers because multi-story buildings can have pipes, trash chutes, and ductwork that carry asthma triggers throughout the building and give pests easy access. Basements are often damp and that can lead to mold growth. 
we asked some of these questions about the building it's itself, um, whether it's a multifamily building or a house. And this is because some of the factors can affect not only the asthma exposures, but how you decrease the exposures. To help reduce particles in air, there are three areas to focus on. Source control, which is limiting the amount of pollutants brought in or created inside, ventilation, and filtration. Indoor air quality can be affected by pollutants brought in or circulated by HVAC systems, as well as a number of appliances and fixtures used indoors. Sometimes air with indoor pollutants pass from unoccupied spaces in a home, such as a crawl space, basement, attic, wall cavities, into the areas where people live. High efficiency pleated filters should be installed within the HVAC system, initially by a professional if possible. Keep in mind that if the filters are not fitted correctly, indoor pollutants can still enter the living space. If the filters are installed incorrectly, as shown in the top image, it, it, the air can pass around the sides of the filters, allowing particles to be carried into the living space. The bottom image of the graphic shows air passing through a properly fitted filter. Some people have whole house heating systems while others use space heaters or other means to heat individual rooms. These choices might be based on the function, functional condition of the system, cost, climate, or age of the building. During winter and cold weather, people use heating devices and close their windows to keep their homes warm. They might put plastic sheeting on windows or use other insulation methods to help retain the heat. In many cases, intake of fresh air is limited. Limiting the amount of air, outdoor air that comes in may help with home heating, but it can present problems. Pollution created inside can build up, including indoor particles and gases that can tr trigger asthma or allergic reactions. Asthma management may include addressing indoor pollutants from the primary source of heating, ventilation, and cooling. Secondary he heating sources might also be a concern. For example, unvented combustion sources, appliances such as kerosene space, space heaters are not recommended. Such fuel burning appliances can create particulate matter and gaseous pollutants. If used, all fuel burning appliances should be vented to the outside. Pollutants from fireplaces and wood stoves with no dedicated outdoor air supply can be backdrafted into the chimney, into the living space, particularly in weatherproofed homes. To prevent fire hazards, make sure the doors and the shutters to the appliances are firmly closed before ventilating the space. And just because the smoke alarm is not going off does not mean that indoor pollutants from the combustion are below the level of threshold for triggering an asthma attack. Air conditioning units can keep some outdoor asthma triggers such as pollen and other particles from entering the home. However, if residents have a window air conditioning unit, they should keep the drip pans and drain, cleans, uh, drain lines clean and in good working order so that mold and other microorganisms are not carried into the home along with the cold air. Evaporative coolers are common in some parts of the country. Those are especially difficult to maintain properly without increasing humidity in the home, which can lead to mold growth. To prevent asthma symptoms when cooling a home, several factors need to be considered. Cooling a home has the potential to create water problems, which can lead to mold growth. Condensation can occur when the temperatures of the room and the surfaces, uh, with the room air and the surfaces in contact, uh, if, when those temperatures vary greatly. Condensation on surfaces can affect materials that are susceptible to waters, such as wood, wallboard, ceiling tiles, cabinetry, and cardboard. Condensation can drip from window panels, damaging the wood frames and potentially created mold problems near or around the windows. If residents see condensation or moisture collecting on windows, walls, or pipes, they need to act quickly to dry the wet surface, reduce the moisture, and address the water source. Condensation can be a sign of high humidity. People who live in a high humid environment might consider using a dehumidifier to keep humidity within the appropriate range between 30 to 50%. 
Cooking can increase moisture and generate indoor air pollutants, including gases and particles. For people with asthma, indoor air pollutants from cooking can be irritants or worsen asthma symptoms. Moisture from cooking can accumulate and cause mold problems if wet materials, such as kitchen cabinets, are not able to dry out. It's important to use exhaust fans that exhaust to the outside or open windows when cooking. Sometimes residents choose to use air cleaners to remove asthma triggers in their homes. Eliminating the source of asthma triggers, such as candles, cigarettes, perfumes, air fresheners, is the best method for controlling indoor air quality. Ventilation and air cleaning are used to help remove particles and gases, and EPA has a consumer guide and a more technical summary about using air cleaners at home. Secondhand smoke can trigger asthma episodes and increase the severity of attacks. Secondhand smoke is also a risk factor for new cases of asthma in preschool age children. Children's developing bodies make them more susceptible to the effects of secondhand smoke, and due to their small size, they breathe more rapidly than adults, thereby taking in more secondhand smoke. Each year, an estimated 28 million multi-unit multi-unit housing res residents are exposed to secondhand smoke in their home or apartment that came from somewhere else in their building, such as a nearby apartment. 100% smoke-free policies are the only effective way to fully eliminate secondhand smoke exposure. In the meantime, encourage and support families with asthma to take action and not allow smoking in their home or car, and connect people who smoke to a smoking cessation program in their state, such as their state quit line. E-cigarettes create an aerosol that contain toxic chemicals. Both tobacco smoke and marijuana smoke also contain particles and combustion byproducts. Also, the Surgeon General, CDC, and many public health advocates recommend including all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and smoke-free rules. Cat, allerg cat and dog allergens are mainly found, found on skin flakes and saliva. The allergens can be found in small, medium, and large particles. As a reminder, small particles are less than 2.5 microns in size, medium 2.5 to 10 microns, and large particles we consider larger than 10 microns. Small particles can remain airborne for hours. Cat and dog allergens can easily be carried on clothes into other locations. Allergen avoidance for cats and dog dogs should focus on removing particles from the surfaces and the air. The most effective way to decrease asthma symptoms from dog or cat allergens is to remove the pet from the home. If the pet is still in the home, several action steps can be used to help decrease pet allergen exposure and symptoms. Taking only one action rather than a combination of actions might not decrease asthma symptoms. For several years, clinicians have advised keeping pets out of bedrooms to decrease exposure to allergens. From the previous slides on particle sizes, it is clear that pet allergens on small particles can flow throughout a home. This was a big paradigm shift in pet allergen avoidance. This meant that clinicians and public health practitioners were finally honest with patients. Keeping pets out of the bedroom was not enough to decrease exposure or symptoms. In a study of cat allergens in homes, all homes that had a cat had high levels of cat allergen in the home. Even in homes that did not currently have a cat living in the home, 30% of the homes had high cat allergen. If the resident has cat allergies, is having symptoms, and doesn't have a cat, then maybe this could be explained by the potentially high levels even without a pet. In homes with a cat, all levels of cat allergens were high in the bedroom if the cat was allowed in that room. However, even if the cat was not allowed in the bedroom, 40% of the homes had cat allergen levels. So just keeping the cat out of the bedroom is not enough to decrease exposure. If the resident keeps the cat out of the bedroom, the resident also needs to know they have to do these other three steps in the checklist, which is wash furry pets, use an air cleaner with a HEPA filter, and use allergen-proof mattress and pillow covers to encase the larger particles in the mattress so it doesn't get to your breathing area.
Even people who don't have furry pets can be exposed to pet allergens in their homes and elsewhere. For example, bringing in used furniture from a home that had pets will introduce pet allergen into that home. Pet allergen can also be carried into the home or clothes or other soft furnishings and from other locations such as daycare or a friend's home. Exposure might be greater in homes with carpet, which can hold more pet allergen than a smooth surfaced floor. Therefore, just because a pet is not living inside the home, we should not assume pet allergens are not in that home. Along with cats and dogs, other animals in the home can be a source of allergens and irritants. These include furry pets, such as hamsters, gerbils, guinea pigs, rabbits, and ferrets. Birds have allergens too. Pet food can attract cockroaches, rodents, and other pests. All cages and litter boxes of pets should be cleaned regularly. Preferably the person with asthma should not be doing this cleaning. The cleaning should be done with proper ventilation with, while the person with asthma is away from the area. Different types of cockroaches are found in different climates. American cockroaches are common in the Southern United States and in basements throughout the US. German cockroaches are common in single family and multifamily homes that have pest infestations. In some places, cockroaches might be called water bugs or palmetto bugs. These are still cockroaches. Mice also different, differ. Field mice, for example, might only enter a home when it's cold outside. Other types of mice live year round in the house or the multifamily building. Rats are rarely found in homes. Therefore, rat allergen in homes is rare. However, many people really can't tell the difference between rats and mice, so that's why we often ask about both. Mouse and rat allergens are found mainly in urine, but also in dander, which is another term for skin flakes. The airborne allergens can be found on small, medium, and large particles, but the small particles, that less than 2.5 microns in size, can remain airborne for hours. On the other hand, cockroach allergens are mainly found in fecal pellets or droppings, also in dried body parts. The cockroach allergens are found on larger particles, mainly larger than 10 microns, which settle out the air quicker than mouse or rat allergen particles. Several things can affect pests and their allergens. Changes by residents in the home, new roommates, particle, parties with a lot of food, a new pet, Changes in the building, new home, new holes, resident, uh, recent pesticide application in neighboring buildings, and then seasonal changes. Cold weather can drive pests indoors. The next slide shows examples of changes inside and outside the home that can affect pests and their allergens. Leaving trash next to buildings can attract pests such as cockroaches and rodents. Subsequently, the pests enter the buildings to find other sources of food and shelter. Leaving dirty dishes in the sink or on the table can also attract pests if left overnight. A mold can go, begin to grow too. Integrated pest management is best described by its component words. Integrated means it uses multiple approaches that work together. Pest, unwanted rodents and bugs in the home, and management means it uses effective methods for pest control with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. Two main concepts of integrated pest management are, one, make physical changes in the home, such as cleaning and sealing cracks and holes, and two, educate the residents to clean up spills, eat only in the kitchen or dining room, use sealed food containers to keep pests out, and dispose of trash often. Various methods are available to control pests. Gel bait application for insects, such as cockroaches. Snap traps are used for mice and rats. However, spray pesticides, bombs, and foggers are asthma triggers. Avoid using them. Also, be sure to keep pests and traps away from children and pets. Cockroaches just don't crawl on floors. They crawl on walls and ceilings too. First, place sticky traps or monitors throughout the home to show, help show where cockroaches live and the pathways they follow throughout the home. Those are the ideal spots to place bait. 
Common places for traps are under kitchen and bathroom sinks and on kitchen counters where food is stored. The traps have a sticky substance with a natural chemical attractant inside the trap. We use these pheromone monitored traps um, to monitor the cockroach population. They're not primarily used as a pest control method. Home visitors, residents, or professionals can place these easy to use monitors around the home in areas where cockroaches travel to find food, water, and shelter. Monitoring can help guide the residents where to focus their IPM efforts, such as where to place gel baits for cockroaches. The most recent evidence by expert panels supports the use of IPM to decrease exposure, asthma symptoms, and emergency department visits. In multifamily buildings, infestation from other apartments can occur inside the unit and in common areas, so building-wide approaches might be necessary. That might require engaging the landlord and other tenants in the process. IPM is an ongoing process for homes that have pest problems. It is not a one-time fix. IPM can prevent infestations. Molds are type of, types of fungi. They are related to, but different from mushrooms and yeasts. Mold is a general term for types of fungi that are velvety, fluffy, or cotton-like, unlike yeasts, which are slimy or wax-like. Mold can grow on an organic surface, such as wood, fabric, or paper, if they're damp. Outdoors, mold plays an important role in nature by breaking down organic matter, such as dead trees and leaves. Indoors, however, mold and yeast growth, all types, regardless of color, should be avoided. Here are some examples of things that are not mold. Rust can result from water damage, but it is not mold. Nonetheless, it could be a marker for where, where mold might occur. Likewise, water damaged ceiling tile is not mold, but it could be a marker for potential mold growth on the other side of the tile. Like mold, you can find algae where there's a lot of water. However, it is different from mold. Mold is found virtually in every environment. It can be detected indoors and outdoors year round. Mold growth is encouraged by warm and humid conditions. Outdoors, mold can be found in damp areas or places where leaves or other vegetation are decomposing. Indoors, mold can be found where humidity levels are high, such as showers. It's impossible to eliminate all mold and mold spores in the environment, how in, in the indoor environment. However, mold growth can be restricted by controlling moisture indoors. Common sources or causes of water or moisture problems include roof leaks, leaks from plumbing, window air conditioners, and other appliances. Condensation associated with high humidity or cold spots in the building, localized flooding, and uncontrolled humidity. Common sites for indoor mold growth include bathroom tiles, basement walls, areas around windows where moisture condenses, under leaky sinks. Possible locations of hidden mold can include leaking or condensing pipes, walls behind furniture or condensation forms, this can occur especially if furniture is pushed against a cold exterior wall of the home. Drain pans inside air handling units. Ductwork. Roof materials above the ceiling tiles. This is a photo of mold growing on a ceiling tile. This is mold growth that occurred after a plumbing leak. This slide shows an infrared photo of the temperature of different surfaces in a home. The box shows temperature differences around a window. The red and yellow areas are hotter next to the cooler blue area below the windowsill. Large differences in temperature on surfaces will lead to condensation. Many things can change the conditions that give rise to mold. When residents change their furnishings, such as pillows, windows, uh, pillows, carpets, mattresses, or furniture, the mold exposure can change. Donated and even new materials can have mold, depending on where the materials had been stored. Um, home visitors might also consider this when they see new or different furnishings in the home. 
In some regions of the country, people live in the homes differently according to the season. For example, in hot summer months, the air conditioning might be used a lot and windows and doors are closed. Any asthma triggers in the home can get sealed indoors. Likewise, in the cold winter months, the home can be sealed and the asthma triggers in the home are sealed in too. Raking and walking around outside can bring mold in from leaves. Pests can also change the mold levels in the home. They might bring in mold from the outside, then jump onto furniture and beds. This increases the concentration of mold spores in the home, although it might not necessarily lead to mold growth on a surface. Frequent vacuuming with a HEPA filter might help remove mold brought into the home. Cleaning out filters and vacuum bags can lead to exposure, so again, bags should be entered, emptied in an area away from the main living space, such as a garage if you have it. Use of humidifiers usually means the air is dry and people are trying to make it more comfortable. However, if the humidifier is located near a wall or close to the ceiling, moisture can build up on surfaces and lead to mold growth. Humidifiers should be cleaned frequently following manufacturer's instructions to make sure that mold is not growing inside the appliance. There are different types of humidifiers. All of them add humidity to the air. Sometimes a humidifier is called by other names, such as a vaporizer. How to fix, how to reduce mold growth. Fix leaky pipe, uh, fix leaky plumbing and leaks in the building envelope as soon as possible. Watch for condensation and wet spots and fix sources of moisture problems as soon as possible. Keep HVAC drip pans clean, flowing properly and unobstructed. Vent moisture generating appliances such as dryers to the outside. Use exhaust fans when showering and cooking. Maintain low humidity below 50%, ideally 30 to 50% if possible. Residents can use an inexpensive device called a hygrometer to, re to measure relative humidity in the home. Make sure to perform regular, and, regular building and HVAC inspections and maintenance as scheduled. Clean and dry wet or damp spots within 48 hours. Replace absorbent materials such as ceiling tiles and carpet if they're damp. Residents might consider using a dehumidifier in homes with high humidity. Dehumidifiers should be placed in the home, in the room or rooms with the highest humidity. The target range for indoor humidity is 30 to 50%. If a home has a crawl space, extra steps might be required to reduce humidity. After being cleaned, exposed ground within the crawl space should be covered with a plastic sheeting to limit potential mold growth and moisture migration into the house. Then using a dehumidifier inside the home, not the crawl space, might decrease residual moisture that gets into the home. Preferably the person with asthma should not be cleaning the mold. The cleaning should be done with proper ventilation while the person with asthma is away from the area. If the mold is larger than 10 square feet, consider getting a professional to help. Scrub with soapy water to remove the mold growth, dry quickly, and avoid using cleaners with irritants around those with asthma. Clean and dry wet or damp spots within 48, 48 hours. The goal of the mold and moisture module is to focus on ways to reduce mold. While the core assessment of the checklist should be used for all types of housing, the mold and moisture modules should be used only if the mold or moisture issues are suspected. One of the questions in the mold and moisture module addresses building-wide water damage. The question is, have any of your furnishings, clothes, possessions been, a, been in a building that had water damage? During major flood events, mold growth can be prevented by removing water damaged belongings, walls and flooring and quickly drying the building. This photo shows what happens if these steps are not done fast enough, leading to mold growth on wooden studs. Volatile organic compounds, VOCs, are emitted such as, are, are emitted as gases from certain solids or liquids. 
VOCs include a variety of chemicals, some of which have short-term or long-term adverse health effects and can irritate the airways of persons with asthma. Concentrations of many VOCs can be higher indoors compared to outdoors. VOCs can be irritating and harmful to all people with asthma. Limit the exposure to VOCs as much as possible by minimizing product use, using products only when persons with asthma are not present, using less irritating products, follow the manufacturer's instructions for use and storage of the products with VOCs. If products that release VOCs are used, carefully follow the manufacturer's instructions on the label and make sure the area is well ventilated. Never mix house, household care products unless directed on the label. Do not store unopened containers of unused paints or similar materials. Keep products out of reach of children and pets. And when purchasing supplies and cleaners, give preference to those that are third-party certified programs, um, such as Green Seal or EPA's Safer Choice. Dust mites are microscopic. They burrow into textile furniture and bedding and cannot be seen easily. Two of the most common types of allergy, allergies to dust mites come from reactions to two types of dust mites, Dermatophagoides farinae and Dermatophagoides teranicinus. If you've ever heard of allergy testing for DER-F or DER-P, these are the mixtures of allergens from those two common types of dust mites. Although the exposure source is the dust mite, the allergens are found on much smaller particles that people inhale. Allergens are found in fragments of dust mite body parts and dust mite droppings. The allergens can trigger an allergic reaction in some people. This slide shows examples of some types of allergens. DER-F1 comes from one type of dust mite, DER-P1 comes from another type of dust mite, and so on. All types of dust mites like the warm, humid conditions found in some homes, but some dust mites can survive in colder and drier conditions. For example, the dust mite that produces DER-F1 allergen can survive well in the Northeast, but the tropical dust mite, Blomia tropicalis, has higher humidity requirements. Therefore, it is unusual to find the tropical dust mite in the North, much less the allergens it can produce. People who are allergic to one type of dust mite can be allergic to other types too and this is called cross-reactivity. To decrease exposure to dust mites, residents should wash bedding regularly, remove carpeting if possible, or vacuum regularly. They should also use allergen-proof mattress and pillow covers. These strategies work better than others, such as opening a window or using an air filter because particles associated with dust mites can settle out of the air quickly and attempts to clean the air might not remove the greatest sources of exposure, disturbance of the dust. Most studies have shown that dust mite allergens don't stay in the air for a long time. As mentioned previously, all dust mites need humidity. Residents can try to use this device, a hygrometer, to measure relative humidity in the home. Dehumidifiers can decrease the humidity and make it difficult for the dust mites to survive. Residents should be careful not to dry out the air too much because it can dry out a person's, person's mucous membranes. The goal of the dust mite module is to focus on ways to reduce exposures to dust mite allergens. While the core assessment of the checklist should be used for all types of housing, the dust mite module should be used only if dust mite issues are suspected. The dust mite module might not be useful for very dry parts of the country. As mentioned earlier, dust mites need high humidity, above 50% relative humidity, so not all places have dust mites. Studies show that areas with very dry climates, such as deserts, don't have dust mites or their allergens. In these very dry places, the home visit would likely focus on other asthma triggers. However, some places with high humidity, such as the southern coast, might be so humid that dust mites thrive. In such areas, it will be difficult to control the dust mites themselves. Instead, the home visit should focus on trying to decrease the allergens. For example, residents should try washing bedding, avoiding carpet, and decreasing the 
red check boxes indicated in the dust mite module previously here. Here are some additional resources that might be helpful for the home visitor or the resident. We suggest giving the resident a copy of these resources and other local resources that might help them control indoor allergens. Here are additional resources from EPA about moisture and mold, duct cleaning, and outdoor air. To close, the training has not yet been evaluated for its efficacy in decreasing asthma trigger exposure or the asthma symptoms. Currently, CDC is working on evaluating the use of an online platform for the training to assess pre and post course knowledge, to assess if some concepts need to be more detailed, uh, need more detailed explanations. We expect the evaluation to be finished later this year. Thank you. I'm glad to answer any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Uh, this presentation is now open for questions. Um, as people, you can type your questions into the question and answer or Q&A box in the, uh, the Zoom. Um, the first question we have is how much of the problem are plugins and other types of so-called air fresheners? Right, those emit volatile organic compounds, the VOCs, and it's a constant so source of exposure that's um, occurring at all time if you have them plugged in. There, they serve as an irritant. Great. We had uh, a question uh, about uh, how this training was developed. We know there's a collaboration between CDC, EPA, and um, Housing and Urban Development. Um, so how did the three agencies work together um, and uh, get this uh, training developed and, and promote the training? Right. Starting in 2015, we started biweekly meetings. The, the training, the, the checklist, was on the on each of our websites in I, I believe it was 20, 2018 or 2019. And as soon as we did the checklist, people said, well, I think I actually need a little bit more background and what are the concepts? Why are you recommending using a HEPA filter for this type of allergen, but not this other type of allergen? So that's when we went back to the drawing board and started developing the training. And that, that went online. Oh, that's important to, to mention. That went online uh, summer of 2020, right when the pandemic hit. All of this was focused on in-home assessment for asthma triggers. What we found is many of the state and local partner uh, departments of health, they were slammed with COVID response, of course. But as they started coming uh, up for air, they started having virtual trainings. And one of the positive things that emerged from that is that um, when, when you try to schedule a home visit and the family's not there, uh, then you have to like reschedule, reschedule with them many times. So the appointments were kept, uh, they were more on time and people would stick to their appointments because all they had to do was answer the phone. And when you answer the phone, you can also say, hey, can you show me, Let, let's take a look under uh, your kitchen sink. They could take the cell phone and look in those places. Also, one of the things we heard about the virtual home training is that it didn't seem so intrusive. So if there were rooms that people didn't want them to see, they could say, I really just don't want to show you that room, but uh, take the phone into the living room. That's fine. So that, that was uh, an unusual thing that there seemed to be uh, more attendance for these, for these home visits or you know, virtual visits. And it gave a, a greater sense of privacy to some of the families. Great. It's a question about mold. Um, and if, is mold found in every single house? And if so, when does mold actually become concerning? Is it a certain mm. level, a certain type? Mold is everywhere. It is in this room, this office I'm sitting in right now. It's in this chair over here. It, it's whether it's growing. If mold is growing or had been growing, it could be dead now. Um, but if, when you have visible mold, for sure, you're that mold growth should be cleaned up uh, and dried. If you have active spots uh, that keep on happening on the on ceiling tiles, for example, you should find the source of the moisture, fix the moisture, and then clean it up. Um, how much mold is too much mold? It really vary, varies uh, 
depending on individual person's susceptibility. So um, I might be okay with like just one mold spot in my shower, but someone who's very, very sensitive upon repeated ex exposures, people with allergies um, mount a faster and more intense immune response. So that one spot of mold in the shower might be too much for somebody. Um, there's a question about uh, that uh, many of the solutions to minimize triggers seem to be uh, relatively expensive. So really good air filters, mattress covers, mm -hmm. air cleaners. Um, are there any resources for lower income persons? There are. I want to go back to the part about expense, though. One of the things that you can do is um, if you have if you have a pet, a cat and a dog, and I, I, you know, have family members and friends that the, those are members of the family, but you, you can go, you can bend over backwards to try to decrease the allergens in the homes, but the, it, the, the best way really is to, to find another home for that pet. So, um, in ter it, instead of using the dust mite or the mattress covers and the HEPA filters, um, also, things that you can do for integrated pest management are not so expensive. Making just sh sure that you've got you you fix the the ceiling the, the seal the cracks and the holes, and that you're not eating um, a, a bag of chips in in your bedroom and uh, attracting the cockroaches into your bedroom. So there's some common sense approaches that are not too expensive. Uh, a, a few years ago, I published a paper with an EIS officer that showed, it was from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey that showed it, that families with as, uh, persons with asthma, that they did spend money on HEPA cleaners using exhaust fans when they take showers. So we know that people are using these asthma mitigation strategies. We have to make sure that we're talking to the public in a way that they use them properly. And um, if they can find other alternative methods that are not so expensive to decrease these allergens. Uh, there's a question about uh, cooking sources and if using uh, an electric stove, but frying something, does that uh, constitute any risk factors for asthma? Uh, Absolutely. If you have ever been frying something on, and your smoke alarm has gone off, way before the smoke alarm went off, you are getting a high dose of particulate matter mm -hmm. and, um, and other chemicals as well. Yes. Um, there's a question about the National Environmental Health Association formerly had a healthy home certification um, and several states have adopted a version of that. And there's a questionnaire that's available through that program, the healthy home certification. Mm. Um, is, yeah. Are you familiar with the program and have you seen what states have done with that with the healthy homes program? Yeah, that's the National Center for Healthy Housing. Uh, it is not a federal government organization. It's a, a, a private organization, uh, not for profit, though. Um, yeah, they have really been a, a champion of healthy home principles. But again, it's not a federal government organization. Has there been any consideration in encouraging states to combine uh, the asthma assessments, uh, home assessments, with other home health assessments? For example, uh, children with high blood levels, uh, lead levels, uh, for example. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great idea. The Healthy Homes uh, push at, at several of our agencies ha has been strong to try to take advantage. If you're going to have a, a home visitor, have them focus on multiple potential hazards in the home. Um. Have you assessed the positive impact of having a bed versus sleeping on a floor or, or elsewhere? I have not. Um, um, I, I think I would need a little bit more context for that. Yeah. Um, that there's a question on what uh, VOC stands for. That one's volatile organic compound. Uh, I would just... Uh... Right. And quickly answer that one. Um, how to evaluate uh, heating ducts or heating and cooling ducts for um, all the pollutants uh, discussed? Is there a, an appropriate way to assess uh, heating and cooling ducts? I am leaving the screen on here. EPA has a, an excellent document that goes into detail about should you have your ducts clean? And 
it's um, in most cases usually not necessary, but there are some cases where you might have had um, you might have been affected by by hurricanes, for example, and now you have some sludge in there. So I, I recommend for th those detailed questions to go to EPA's document. Um, question about uh, yeast that is used for cooking um, is can that be a potential allergen? Oh, absolutely. There are studies of occupational exposures uh, with with bakers. So yeast can be an allergen for sure. Um, what if an allergic person, uh, such as a child, has a visitor who owns pets? That's not a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll go to the next one. Um, can you talk about space heaters and which kind might be recommended? Mm. Space heaters, space heaters, um, it, as long as you're not using an unvented kerosene heater, um, that should be okay. Space heaters have their own concerns though, uh, in terms of injury prevention. Um, it, that is all the questions right now. If you have any other questions, please enter them into the Q&A. A lot, of, a lot of thank yous for your presentation. Um, and there's questions about uh, the recording and Lillian put the uh, links to the website for where the recording will be available in about a month. Um, and, and these slides are available also online. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to do that in the chat, but maybe if I, someone I, else... I went ahead and put the uh, the link to the slides okay. available in the chat with the notes. So okay. that's great. Uh, the website. Is there similar guidance as far as soft or plush toys to um, as a potential for allergen? Um, is the guidance similar as for linens and sheets um, in terms of washing and uh, taking care of them for toys? Right. So that has been a, a question, again, sort of like trying to keep the pets with the, the family. Um, you know, children are really tied to some of their toys. If you can get toys that are easily laundered, that would be ideal. Um, this, there, there are no scientific studies that I know of, um, but you can also put that toy in a, a sealed plastic bag and put it in the freezer for a couple of days. And that would definitely get rid of dust mite allergen um, sorry, it would get rid of dust mites. They would not be able to survive. However, the dust mite allergen could still remain on that toy. Okay, a couple of questions that are actually just asking me to post the link to the slide again. So I'll do that for everybody. Where the slides are. Okay. Well, Dr. Chu, we don't have any more questions. So I, I think I want to thank you so much for your time to, uh, to to give us this wonderful lecture and presentation and take the time out to give us a presentation. Um, our next Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds will be on Wednesday, uh, April 5th. And uh, we hope that everyone uh, joins us at, at that time. And thank you for your, your time today. Thank you. Bye.